This is a brief overview of uh, glomerular diseases. So we will cover most important primary podocyte diseases uh, that present with nephrotic syndrome, and then I will move over to most common nephritic lesions, and then at the end I will talk a little bit about a couple of uh, different systemic diseases. So what you see here is a schematic of a glomerulus with four capillary loops, and I really want you to pay close attention to um, GBM that goes around and wraps around the um, uh, whole structure. Uh, so uh, it goes from one capillary to another, separating the intercapillary space and the mesangium from the extra uh, capillary uh, space. Um, and this is very important in understanding of uh, the glomerular pathology. The structure is really the basis of it. Um, so uh, let's first address the nephrotic lesions and um, uh, extra capillary space. Um, those commonly affect podocytes uh, in a diffuse manner. Uh, podocytes are uh, epithelial cells, and uh, they are also called visceral epithelial cells, and they attach to the uh, glomerular basal membrane, as you see here in the uh, lower um, left corner, and uh, this is how they uh, sort of like normally uh, look like. Uh, if you imagine having a diffuse podocyte injury um, that affects all glomeruli in uh, both kidneys, uh, this will result in um, uh, a nephrotic type picture, uh, and the uh, cells will look like this approximately. Um, so you will have a diffuse effacement of foot process. The cells will not be able to keep that um, ultrastructure with, with the foot process. So the cell will just sit on, on top of the glomerular basal membrane. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, light microscopy uh, in, in uh, such lesions, um, you will see actual normal structure. But when you look at the uh, electron microscopy, you will see diffuse effacement of foot process. This is minimal change disease type lesion. So you have cell dysfunction. Now, if you imagine that you have a very severe injury to the podocytes, uh, that where you can develop extensive effacement of foot process, but also um, uh, cell death. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to make a, a really a, a, a real picture of cell death, but you can imagine you know, that this is a very unhappy cell about to actually get detached from the glomerular basal membrane. This is really what happens in focal sclerosis, and this is how focal sclerosis is different from minimal change disease. So. Uh, some cells will die off and detach from the GBM, and uh, this is the place where one will develop initial hyperfiltration across the membrane and then consequent segmental hyalinosis. And by light microscopy, this translates into focal and segmental sclerosis. Uh, membranous nephropathy is another important uh, nephrotic uh, lesion, and uh, what you have, uh, have there is a renal-limited autoimmune disease. In its primary form, about 80% of patients develop antibodies against a specific uh, membrane-bound podocyte antigen, so-called M-type phospholipase A2 receptor. So the antibody will come from circulation and bind inside to uh, that antigen that is part of the um, uh, membrane of the podocyte, and the uh, uh, complement will also get activated, uh, which will result in um, uh, effacement of foot process, but you will also have formation of uh, sub-epithelial deposits. And as you can tell, you know, these sub-epithelial deposits really interfere with attachment of the podocytes uh, to the basal membrane. And because of that, the basal membrane will start uh, creating uh, spikes uh, to help uh, podocyte uh, attach better to the basal membrane. And you can see these spikes if you stain the section with silver stain, uh, because the, the silver stain really uh, stains um, basal membrane material in black, and it will not stain deposits, so you will be able to visualize that by light microscopy. Uh, so these are uh, three more, uh, most important, actually, uh, nephrotic uh, uh, lesions, and I will move on to talk about nephritic lesions now. Um, imagine a similar process to membranous, but it's just occurring uh, on the other side of the membrane. For example, in uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis, the process really starts during limited streptococcal infection. 
and uh, the, during that time bacterial antigen get planted um, like you see here um, in the subendothelial space and sometimes actually uh, you can see it in subepithelial space so you can have a kid with um, a strep throat or um, a person with with skin infection and during that infection uh, you will be planting these antigens, as I mentioned, and uh, you will be, uh, within a couple of weeks, reacting by uh, forming um, antibodies that um, will um, uh, cause formation of immune complexes and uh, with activation of complement and formation of subendothelial and uh, sub some subepithelial deposits. Those subepithelial deposits are uh, rare and few and uh, hump-like in, in their shape, uh, but subendothelial deposits will really drive a picture and cause uh, intracapillary uh, hypercellarity. Uh, what happens is actually that this response really elicit uh, inflammatory reaction, and you have inflammatory cells right there because this is within the circulation. Unlike uh, the entire membranous process that I described a little bit ago, um, that uh, is completely outside the circulation and therefore it's uh, not really very inflammatory. But what you see here uh, is that uh, uh, the uh, uh, capillary will get completely occluded by the, this inflammatory reaction, uh, which will result in drop in GFR um, and uh, increase in creatinine, um, and uh, this will result in decrease in uh, urinary output, the, the lower GFR. Um, this uh, inflammatory reaction will also create breaks in the GBM and uh, the bleed um, into uh, the urinary space and down the tubules, and you will see that as hematuria. So the urine will be dark, um, uh, like Coca-Cola urine, and uh, it will be of smaller amount. Uh, so the patient will develop fluid retention uh, with uh, hypertension and edema. Uh, all of this constitutes acute nephritic picture that goes away rather quickly within a few days as the subendothelial de dense deposits um, get removed and um, um, uh, subepithelial deposits will actually really uh, remain there for a longer time because they are outside the circulation similar to, to those subepithelial deposits in membranous. So that's post-infectious GN and um, this is usually a one-shot type injury. Uh, that uh, basically uh, um, uh, occurs after the inf infection most of the time is already over, like strep throat uh, uh, goes away, and then you develop um, uh, post-infectious GN, and then that's also self-limited. Um, but now imagine a process where you have uh, formation of uh, subendothelial deposits uh, in, in uh, more of a chronic way. Uh, for example, um, you have a patient with uh, chronic antigenemia uh, that is either chronic infection, such as chronic viral infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, number of bacterial infections with abscesses or endocarditis, um, or a uh, number of parasitic infections. Some of them can actually really go on for a long time, for months, even years, uh, not to say decades. Um, think of uh, uh, also uh, autoimmune diseases that also can have chronic antigenemia, such as uh, systemic lupus or Sjogren's and so on. Uh, so diseases that um, uh, result in uh, chronic antigenemia in circulating immune complexes can result in this kind of a picture. So you have subendothelial deposits that uh, don't get removed easily. Um, um, because you have either, you know, like also defect in the immune system or uh, it's just like too much on the immune system to remove these or they're not really effectively activating uh, the inflammatory response here. Um, and the endothelium gets sick and tired of it because it's supposed to really line uh, the inside of the capillary. So what's going to happen here now is that the endothelium will, will form a new basal membrane so it can regrow that, and uh, it, this will result in a double contour. Uh, so this is a MPGN uh, a pattern of inj injury or membrane of proliferative uh, glomerulonephritis. Moving on, uh, if you now imagine a process where you have um, formation of antibodies against glomerulonephritis membrane, um, anti-GBM disease, 
so you form these antibodies, they bind to the basal membrane. You can see that by immunofluorescence as uh, diffuse linear staining with uh, immunoglobulin G. Um, so uh, this will also activate complement uh, on the basal membrane and result in basal membrane um, uh, breaks, as you see here. And then because of that, the, 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 the uh, blood with fibrin and everything else comes out into the urinary space and uh, 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 parietal epithelial cells will start to proliferate and they will form crescents. So this is crescentic uh, GN. And one of the examples is anti-GBM, but there are other things that can create um, crescents like uh, ANCA disease and uh, immune complex diseases, including post-infectious that I uh, already mentioned a little bit ago. So these are nephritic lesions. And uh, as promised, I will go over a couple of systemic di diseases, diabetes and amyloidosis. Both of them are uh, really uh, affecting multiple structures in uh, multiple diff different organs. Uh, and in the kidney, they um, cause tremendous injury to all compartments, not only glomeruli, but you see a lot of tubular interstitial disease in both of these diseases, uh, vascular disease, and so on. Uh, in the glomeruli, uh, di diabetes uh, induces mesangial cell injury, uh, causing overproduction of the mesangial matrix and formation of nodules. Uh, the GBM also um, uh, becomes thicker, and uh, uh, it detaches from the mesangium, uh, which will result actually in uh, formation of microaneurysms. So instead of you know having these separate capillary loops, you will be, they will become like one giant loop, and we call that microaneurysm. Uh, so that's diabetes. So the glucose will affect mesangial cells. It will uh, also um, um, create uh, injury to the endothelial cells. And uh, in diabetes, eventually, you get uh, also uh, um, injury to the podocytes. And basically, every cell, cell type will suffer. Uh, Amyloidosis is a disease of um, um, uh, also systemic disease with deposition um, in uh, the glomeruli, tubal interstitium, um, vasculature. But in the glomeruli, it starts from the mesangium, where you have the position of this um, 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 acellular amyloid material, and uh, it goes actually through the uh, um, uh, capillary walls and down the capillary walls and completely destroys the structure of the glomerulus with um, um, uh, formation also of uh, amyloid nodules and so on. Uh, the material is congruent positive, gives apple green birefringence under polarized light. Uh, there are a large number of proteins that can form amyloid. Um, important ones are light chains and multiple myeloma and uh, uh, serum amyloid A in reactive amyloidosis that is associated with inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, and so on. Immunofluorescence can help figure out different uh, types of um, amyloid. Uh, so this was the big picture of glomerular disease. Uh, please watch my other videos on specific lesions if you uh, want to hear more detail. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate you taking time and uh, watching this uh, little video. And uh, um, I hope you um, also visit me in my other videos. Thank you very much.